Good morning. God is good. All the, All the time. God is good. Can we hear some beeps on that one? God is good. All the time. God is good. There you go. <laughs> it's so good to be here this morning. And you know what? I kind of thought it might be bad, but it's really pretty, pretty nice out here. It's not terribly cold. And this is the day that we celebrate joy. So we are full of joy here to be at our church this morning. We're so glad to see everybody in the parking lot. And we know there's a lot of people there coming in from home. So if you're coming in from home, check in and say, hey, I'm here. And also, if you have a prayer request, please put it on the comment section now so Heather can get it for the pastor. Uh, I've got, uh, I know this is a shopping time and everybody is busy trying to get that last minute um, gift bought. Well, you know what? We can help you out here at Mount Tabor. Our ladies group still has some really good nuts downstairs. And I mean, the kind you eat, you know, but <laughs> anyhow, we do have nuts. And if anyone would like to get some for oh, Christmas packages or whatever, then please give me a call or give Darlene a call. We're on the church registry. Or you can give Heather a note on comments today if you need some nuts, and we'll get back to you. But we do have quite a bit left, so if you need to, to get some nuts, then we're good to go. We have plenty for you. Uh, our scripture this morning comes from 1 Thessalonians 5, 16 through 24. Be joyful always, pray continually, give thanks in all circumstances, for this is God's will for you in Christ Jesus. Do not put out the Spirit's fire, do not treat prophecies with contempt, test everything, hold on to the good, avoid every kind of evil. May God himself, the God of peace, sanctify you through and through. May your whole spirit, soul, and body be kept blameless at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. The one who calls you is faithful, and he will do it. May the Lord bless this reading for all of us this morning, and may the Lord bless each one of you. Technical difficulties are holding things up just a bit, but we will get there. He's he's live streaming to the wrong one. Uh. Good morning. Got some prompts that wants to blow away this morning, but I uh, just want to ask you, how many are feeling happy today? Well, I, I got this for a reason. There's some things that I want to announce, and if you're happy, or if it's something that makes you happy, toot your horn and I'll put up the smiley face. A sunny day. Falling down and skinning your knee. That's a sad face. An ice cream cone. <laughs> a puppy. Losing your favorite toy.
getting a new toy. <laughs> Feeling all alone. Getting an A on a test in school. <laughs> getting a bad grade on a test in school. <laughs> when you miss someone. Spending time with your friends. When you think about all the different things that can make you happy and sad, it's pretty simple. If something makes you feel good and something good happens, you're generally happy. If something bad happens or someone gets hurt or someone passes away, we are sad. But I want you to listen to what Jesus said in our Bible because Jesus wants us to be happy. I'm going to read John 15, verses 9 through 11. It says, I have loved you even as the Father has loved me. Remain in my love. When you obey my commandments, you remain in my love just as I obey my Father's commandments and remain in his love. I have told you these things so that you will be filled with my joy. Yes, your joy will overflow. Today we will light the joy candle and... You know, Jesus, like I said, Jesus wants us to be happy. And even when we are sad, if we remember that Jesus is in our hearts and are with us, know that he loves us, we will still have some joy even when we're sad. So let us pray. Gracious and Heavenly Father, we thank you, Lord, for this wonderful day that you've given us. We know that you love your Son and that your Son loves us. Help us to remain in his love so that we will be filled with joy. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. One, two, three. Have a great week. Good morning. This third week of Advent, we are lighting the joy candle. True joy in scripture, we see this, see that it comes as one of the fruits of the Holy Spirit. Joy comes from believing God, belonging to his kingdom, and knowing Jesus as our Lord. Let us remember that good news of Jesus' birth has the power of bringing great joy this Christmas season. Our joy isn't dependent on what is going on in our life, in our world, or the people that we are with. It does not depend on the gifts we give or receive. No earthly thing can ever give us complete joy. Our joy comes from our Lord and Savior. That joy that flooded the hearts of the shepherds, the angels, the wise men, the hosts of heaven, and Mary and Joseph, is the joy that still has the power to overwhelm our hearts with rejoicing. Now I will light the candle of joy as also known as the shepherd's candle to highlight the joy the shepherds experienced when they received the good news about Jesus Christ's birth.
morning to all of you. Good to see you all today. Not as chilly as it has been the last few weeks. Um, I'm not going to lie, though. I, I wore the big coat, so I would have an excuse to wear the Columbus Crew scarf one more time because they won the Major League Soccer Cup last night, and I was really excited. So anyway, that has nothing to do with anything. Um, but I do want to uh, open this morning, actually open the next part of the service with some prayer, and then we'll sing a little bit, and then we'll get into the sermon. This is a, this is a, a joyous day today. We've got a lot to celebrate. So let's, uh, let's continue with a word of prayer. Lord, we thank you this morning that as we are gathered here, even though, again, this doesn't feel like our typical Advent season, Lord, that you are with us as much or more than ever. And Lord, we thank you for your presence with us today. We ask that you be with us in the rest of this service. Lord, be present in our worship as we lift our voices to you. And Lord, remind us that that prophecy so long ago came true in Christ. And Lord, that Christ lives in our hearts and brings us joy regardless of what we face day to day. Lord, help us to keep our focus on that this season and find our joy and our purpose and, Lord, our life in you. Be with us today, we pray, and we ask it in the name of Christ. Amen. Well, if you would like to sing, um, you can come out in front of your vehicles, stand right in front of your cars. Do keep your masks on. I'll pop mine back on, too, here in a second. Uh, but if you'd like to join in singing a couple of Christmas carols, we will do that now. Um, I did, I thought I sent an email this morning to everybody. I ended up accidentally just sending it back to the church email account instead of to the entire Elkview charge. I'm sorry about that, but I think it's a couple of familiar carols. We're going to sing, Oh, Come All You Faithful, and Hark the Herald Angels Sing. So if you'd like to get out, you're welcome to do so. They can stay in the car. They can stay in the car all the windows. Yeah, you can stay in your cars if you'd like to, too, but if you'd like to get out and sing, you're more than welcome. join together in O Come All Ye Faithful. O come all ye faithful, joyful and triumphant. O come ye, O come ye to Bethlehem. Come and behold him, born the King of too, but man, it is to me. We're going to sing one more, and uh, let's join in Hark the Herald Angels Sing. I'll try to not pitch it in the basement this time. <laughs> Hark the Herald Angels Sing, glory to the newborn King, peace on earth and mercy mild. God and sinners reconcile. Joyful all ye nations rise. Join the triumph of the skies. With the angelic host proclaim, Christ is born in Bethlehem. Hark the herald angels sing. Glory to the newborn King. Christ by highest heaven adored, Christ the everlasting Lord. Late in time, behold Him come, offspring of the virgin. 
guys, uh, we're going to move ahead now. So good to hear you all sing. If you have your Bibles with you, uh, I will invite you to turn to Isaiah 61. That's where we're going to start out today. Uh, we'll bounce over to the Gospel of John at one point in the middle, too. But we'll start in Isaiah 61. Um, this is uh, part of the early, some of the, some of the other prophecies about Christ coming. And we'll jump ahead to seeing some of that stuff fulfilled, too. Have you ever been given a message to give to somebody else? Is something important. It could have been something as simple as returning an important phone call. You know, you find that little pink important message thing tacked onto your office door at work or whatever, or some sort of other inter-office thing, a memo your boss has to be sent around, hopefully something good. Maybe you worked where it was your job to let somebody know about grants and scholarships being awarded or those sorts of things, that kind of good news, or a newspaper reporter covering a parade or a celebration or one of my favorite things is on the local news channels when they do that hometown hero thing every week. You, know, you bring some good news to folks. You know, the kind of thing you'd really love to tell somebody else about. And maybe it didn't come from somewhere else. Maybe something good just happened to you and you just had to share it with somebody else. You have good news to tell. Well, today is the candle of joy. And, and, and for a thousand years or better, this... This Sunday has actually had a Latin name that we're not going to dwell on too hard, but we've already kind of touched on it. It's called Gaudete Sunday, and Gaudete in Latin means rejoice. And it's, it doesn't just mean that there is a day to rejoice. It's actually a command. It'd be like somebody telling you to rejoice. So that's what this day is about, to be joyful. And so we're going to start with Isaiah once again. He's looking forward to the coming Messiah. He's beginning with this proclamation that we're going to read here in a minute, and we'll trace that through from Isaiah to Christ to us. I think what we're going to find is that Isaiah was not the only one who has good news to rejoice about. Isaiah 61, and we're going to begin at verse 1. I'm just going to read you the first four verses here. Isaiah 61, beginning in verse 1. And Isaiah is, is in the middle of a prophecy here. He's actually in the last chapter laid out a lot of things about the coming of Christ. And then he says this, The Spirit of the Lord God is upon me, because the Lord has anointed me to bring good news to the poor. He has sent me to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives, and the opening of the prison to those who are bound, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor, and the day of vengeance of our God, to comfort all who mourn, to grant to those who mourn in Zion, to give them a beautiful headdress instead of ashes, the oil of gladness instead of mourning, the garment of praise instead of a faint spirit, that they may be called oaks of righteousness, the planting of the Lord, that he may be glorified. They shall build up the ancient ruins, they shall raise up the former devastations and repair the ruined cities, the devastation of many generations. Let's pray. Lord, as we get into the word this morning, we ask first and foremost for your anointing on the word and Lord on the message that you would receive all the glory, Lord, that this is entirely from you, of you, and for you. Lord, secondly, help us to remember that in Christ we see the fulfillment of so many things and of these prophecies that we've read this morning. And help us to, to remember that in meeting him, Lord, that all of the past has been wiped away, Lord, that you dwell in us now and that we have much to rejoice over. Bless us this morning, we pray, and we ask it in the name of Christ. Amen. Now, Isaiah has just been speaking in the previous chapter about the coming glory of Israel. That's a major focus in Isaiah 60. The coming glory is the coming Messiah. That's what he's talking about. Now, Isaiah would obviously not live long enough to see Jesus being born. But given that, I mean, it's really incredible when you look at what he prophesied and what happened 
I mean, I guess it's not surprising given that God was giving the prophecy, but Isaiah was strikingly, specifically accurate about things. Isaiah lived about 700 years before the birth of Christ. So, I mean, for us, in hindsight, it's kind of easy to look back and go, well, yes, he was definitely accurate because we, we saw that happen. But you have to remember, no one had ever heard prophecies like this before. No prophet had ever showed up saying the sorts of things that Isaiah was saying. When Isaiah was giving them, Israel was in a really difficult place. This is, we've bounced around this time period a little bit, but we've had, you know, the Babylonian captivity that we've talked about. Israel's had an incredibly difficult run here. The line from Abraham to the promised land, but then the enslavement in Egypt first, and then the wandering in the wilderness for 40 extra years, and then battles and starving and more enslavement and golden calves and all sorts of stuff, the Babylonian captivity. And in the middle of all of that, most of what the prophets were giving were some not-so-happy messages the majority of the time. Things were bleak. Then along comes Isaiah, and he's now saying in the middle of all this, wait, I have good news to bring to you. In the chapter before this, we said more messianic prophecies are given. Listen, even down to the Magi's gifts of gold and frankincense, prophesied 700 years before they would be given. And then we get here. And just like we said last week, Isaiah is saying here, someone is coming. Company is coming. Messiah is on the way. And here's what that means. We get this really long list of what are just incredible promises. Things that are basically the complete and total exact opposite of what Israel had been experiencing. And it's remarkable, because it's certainly news that Israel would have been surprised at, that they would have rejoiced to receive, because these folks had lived in darkness for a very, very long time. And one of the prophecies, it's, it's not right in here, but it says, you know, the people who walked in darkness have seen a great light. These people were walking in darkness, and listen, Christ was the light they knew was coming. They were looking for a Messiah, and it was him. They would have absolutely rejoiced to receive this. And you might be saying, well, sure, that's, that's wonderful, but what does that have to do with us rejoicing today? Because we know the Messiah came, right? We're not waiting on another one. There is one, and his name is Jesus. We don't have to wait on another Messiah. Well, sure. But did you know this isn't the only place in the Bible that a lot of these words that we read today are recorded? We're going to look at Luke chapter 4. This is actually just a couple of chapters beyond the birth of Christ, but I want to point out a few things from here, too. This is Luke chapter 4. We're going to begin in verse 16. And uh, we have just come through. Uh, Jesus has been baptized. He's been driven into the wilderness by the Spirit to be tempted. He's come back from that, and he begins his ministry. In fact, the temptation ended, you know, five verses before where we are right now. And so we'll pick up at Luke chapter 4, verses 16, or at verse 16. And uh, it's talking about he's returned, he's begun his ministry, and then it says this. He came to Nazareth, where he had been brought up, as was his custom. He went to the synagogue on the Sabbath day, and he stood up to read. And the scroll of the prophet Isaiah was given to him. And he unrolled the scroll and found the place where it was written, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me, because he has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim liberty to the captives, the recovering of sight to the blind, to set at liberty those who are oppressed, and to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. And he rolled up the scroll and gave it back to the attendant and sat down. And the eyes of all in the synagogue were fixed on him, and he began to say to them, Today, this scripture has been fulfilled in your hearing. So now Jesus has arrived. He's been born. He walks into the synagogue in his hometown. It's his turn to read. He reads the scripture there, the same one we read earlier, at least part of it, and then tells them, Today... This is fulfilled in your hearing. Another way that this can be said is today, this scripture's fulfillment is among you at this moment. This is profoundly powerful stuff. 
As Jesus has read the good news from Isaiah and proclaimed that he is now the fulfillment of it, which is more good news to rejoice in. But why exactly? Well, first, we can trust Jesus' words. He was sent by the Father, and you know, we can, it says the Spirit of the Lord is on him, he tells us. Jesus has been set apart and sent, anointed. Now, to be clear, Jesus was born as the second person of the Trinity. Jesus was not some random guy that God descended on and said, now you're going to be the Savior. Oh, no. Jesus existed with God the Father before time began. John 1 tells us that. In the beginning was the Word. The Word was with God, and the Word was God, and he was with God in the beginning. And that is Jesus. The Word is Jesus there. But he's come, he's been born, and God the Father has his hand on him. He is still commissioning his son for a work to be done. So he has been sent, he has been anointed, and he goes with the Holy Spirit. The Spirit of the Lord is on me, he says. Listen, folks, we can do nothing if the Spirit is not in us. Jesus had him with him, we need to have him with, him, with us. But because of that Spirit and because of that sending, Jesus could be trusted then and now. And then he goes on, he binds up our broken hearts. Man, what a beautiful picture that is. Broken by sin, sure. But then once we meet him and we know him, we spend time with him, we find time and time again that he's mending us together when we're hurting. Mending us together when we're mourning. Pulling us back together when we feel like we're falling apart. Feel like we've got nothing left. He binds us together. He binds up the broken hearted. Notice that he doesn't just say he binds up their hearts. He binds up the broken heart. That's the Isaiah passage. In other words, he's putting together the broken heart of the person. Not just their hearts. He's pulling you all together. Jesus is the thing that holds us all together. And freedom, liberty to the captives. And Jesus' birth foretold in Isaiah was going to break the things that imprisoned Israel. Absolutely. And that's, you know, thrust number one of that prophecy. But so often... These prophecies have more than one layer. And so the, other, the second layer is that he's going to break the things that imprison each and every one of us. Sin and pain, death, sickness, darkness, all of it broken in Jesus. Did you know that you could break brokenness? Jesus did that. All of it broken in Jesus. And sometimes those are things we still endure on this side of eternity. But let me be clear. That stuff has no eternal hold on you if Jesus has hold of you. Amen? Sometimes we have to walk through that stuff. But listen, in, when we trust in Christ, those things are broken in eternity and for eternity. And you can take that to the bank. Setting at liberty those who are oppressed. That's another one that's kind of like that. Things that push against us in the day to day. Sins that are hard to break, attacks from the enemy, stuff that presses in on every side. I think it's Colossians where that is. We're pressed on every side, but not crushed. You know that passage? The second half of all that stuff is important. We are pressed on every side, but not crushed. We are persecuted, but not abandoned. We're struck down, but not destroyed. Blessed beyond the curse, it says, because the promise will endure forever. There's a song that ties all that together and finishes it out by saying, the promise will endure and the joy of the Lord will be my strength. Plenty to rejoice in. Because listen, it's freedom not just from the ultimate punishment of death and all that stuff, but freedom from that stuff that oppresses us day to day. The recovery of sight for the blind, this is a huge one. Because at face value, and, and properly so, this is about God's physical healing power. That's absolutely true. God is our healer. One of his names in the scripture, you've probably heard me say this, is Jehovah Rapha. What that literally means is, God is my healer. This is a name that God proclaims about himself. And what you find a lot of the time is you have like Jehovah Rapha, God is my healer, or Jehovah Jireh, the Lord Almighty, or Jehovah Nisi, God is my banner. In other words, he goes before us and those things. The, the adjective that you find tacked after God's name is often an essential part of who God is. And God has often given himself those names for us to use in worship as he did so long ago. 
So when he, when he says, Jehovah Rapha, God is my healer, it doesn't say God might be my healer. God is a healer. We can trust in that. He hears us when we call on him and he answers. And listen, he works through miraculous means. He works through doctors and medical science that is no less the hand of God when we lift those things to him. We're watching him work right now as he's quickening the minds of scientists and researchers who have put together this COVID-19 vaccine. Folks, this thing, this mess that we're in has an end. And I totally believe that it only came as quickly as it did because so many people prayed that it would. And absolutely, recovery of sight to the blind, physical healing. But we see Jesus do that very thing and other healings many other times in the Gospels, but I think it runs even deeper than that. Recovery of sight for the blind. Folks, if it wasn't for Christ coming, we wouldn't really have a real good picture of who God the Father was. We wouldn't know God the way we know him. We've been given eyes to see, as it were. Relationship with God we could not have had in the same way without Christ. Now, yes, people had, a, an, in the Old Testament, they had a relationship with God. But they had to come bring actual blood sacrifices to maintain that relationship. Not, and, and we don't have to do that now, but listen, not because that sacrificial system was abolished. It's God hadn't changed it. It's just that there was only one all-sufficient sacrifice that could then satisfy every sacrifice that would ever be needed ever, and that came in Jesus. So the system hasn't changed. Just the one perfect sacrifice has come. And as Isaiah told, it, told them, he was coming. And as Christ proclaimed in what we read earlier, He's the guy. So people in the Old Testament did have that relationship, but having Christ himself come to live and die and rise and now to live in our hearts opens our eyes to who God is in a much different and fuller way. And then down at the end of this, one of the last things that Jesus says is that he's there to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. This is one of the coolest things in the world. Have you ever heard of the year of jubilee before. Tap, tap your horn if you have it. Just, kind of, okay. Just trying to gauge the room, so, yeah, proverbially. This was a concept in the Old Testament. It would have been a year where slaves would have been freed and all debts would have been canceled and forgiven and totally done away with. But another way of saying the year of jubilee is to say the year of the Lord's favor. Isaiah is saying that when Messiah comes, this same sort of thing would come into play again. And then Jesus shows up and says, that's fulfilled in me. Jesus is the incarnation of the year of Jubilee. Because friends, our sins pile up. They build up a debt that we should owe, that we are supposed to owe, but that we could never possibly pay. Somebody else paid that penalty for us. So not only is the debt canceled, it's forgiven and it's forgotten. And only Christ could do that. And he's proclaiming right here that that's who he is, that he has come to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. He's come to proclaim that all the debts can be forgiven. All that stuff is canceled. The, the sin that keeps you enslaved, free from that now. Because Jesus is the embodiment and the incarnation of the year of Jubilee. That's exactly what he's saying here. When we celebrate Christmas, we're not just celebrating the night that he was born. I mean, yeah, absolutely we do that. But that's not where it stops. So we also celebrate that God has truly been incarnated. I keep coming back to that word, but there's nothing else quite like it. He has taken on humanity not just as some sort of self-flagellating, I guess I'll go do that kind of thing, but as the ultimate act of love and sacrifice. Jesus becoming flesh and tabernacling among us, which is a, a, a better way to translate that thing where it says the word became flesh and dwelt among us. They used tabernacle like a verb there. The tabernacle, the place that moved place to place, but where God's presence dwelt. And so Jesus came, the word became flesh, and tabernacled 
among us. And this tabernacling is the incarnation of God into humanity, the incarnation of the year of Jubilee, the debts forgiven, the slaves set free, all of that bound up in this little child in a manger. And not only that, he said it's not just for some, it's for everyone. Now, initially, I mean, in the scripture it says the gospel came first for the Jews and then for the Gentiles. And there's a passage later in the New Testament that says that we were a wild root that has been grafted onto the vine. Which means that Jesus loved us so much that even though he was the Messiah to the Jews first, he said, I want to save everyone who will believe. And he did. Because, folks, we are Gentiles. If that door hadn't been opened for us, we'd have been lost. But, but that's who our God is is to open the door and graft us on because he loves you that much. That news is not just for the people who Isaiah was talking to 700 years before it happened. It wasn't just for the people sitting around the synagogue when Jesus was talking to them and explaining that he's the fulfillment of all. It's for everyone. It's for you and me and everyone who has ever been born and who has ever lived. It's for them too. And so we don't forget the last couple of weeks, God's ultimate act of love and our need to prepare. Because he is coming again. The company's coming. Clean your room. <laughs> Some of you may have seen on Facebook these last few days, we've been lighting a menorah this week at the house. This is the first time, we've, first time I've ever done this. It's Hanukkah this week. The fourth night is tonight. This is a festival that initially commemorates the rededication of the temple after the Israelites drove out the Greco-Syrian army, who had been there desecrating the temple and putting all sorts of idols and things in the temple that weren't supposed to be there. That's about 180 years before the birth of Christ. And Jesus actually commemorated this uh, the same as everyone else. And that's in John chapter 10, where it says the Feast of Dedication. Hebrew word for dedication is Hanukkah. So if you, if you want to check that out sometime, Jesus also celebrated this. Now, I'm not saying we have to celebrate it as a church, but it's been an interesting journey uh, for us this year because of what that festival commemorates. Now, for our Jewish friends, they commemorate that and celebrate it, certainly, and it's a joyous thing. But for us who know that Jesus is the long-awaited Messiah, the view of even that celebration is different, but it's important. That's why I'm touching on this because the rededication of the temple, God's deliverance from at that point in time is certainly worth remembering and celebrating, but we, we remember more. The center candle on the menorah is called the shamash, and what that means is the servant candle. You light that one first, and then you use that candle to light the other ones. Now, we remember that Christ came not to be served, but to serve, to be a servant. And he is the true light, John says, that gives light to everyone. And we at Christmas celebrate his coming, as Isaiah foretold, sure. We also know that we are now the temple. He says, your body is the temple of the Lord. That's where God dwells with you. Writing his commandments on the tablets of men's hearts, the scripture says. And so we rededicate this temple as we prepare of that gift of Christmas, we know we can. We don't have to go build another altar and make a blood sacrifice. We can give ourselves to God right where we are and say, Lord, if there's anything on this altar that shouldn't be there, clear it off. Put your fire here. Rededicate this here and now. We know that that light is coming again and has come. The light shines now in the darkness, John chapter 1 again. And it says the darkness has not overcome it. That light is Jesus Christ, listen, and that is good news to rejoice about. And so now, with the Spirit of the Lord on you, you can take that good news to everyone. Because my friends, Messiah has been born to you. And he is Christ the Lord. The newborn king of all the ages, the walking, talking, living year of Jubilee, and he still stands ready any time we need him to, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor and cancel every debt, forgive every sin, encourage every heart. And folks, that is truly a reason to rejoice. Amen?
<laughs> As we get ready to close, I'm gonna um, I'm gonna sing just a little chorus. It's not a Christmas chorus, but uh, I'm gonna sing a little chorus while we reflect for a minute, and then we'll close. But if, just think about that. If there's anything that's on the altar of your heart that shouldn't be there, ask God to rededicate you, rededicate this temple here. Because listen, we've got so much to rejoice in, and that's but one part of it. Rejoice in those other aspects of who Christ is, everything he says he is, even in just these short few verses. Because folks, we could unpack that for years and never get to the end of, of everything Christ is to us. So let's reflect for just a minute, and uh, I'll sing a little chorus in the Come, Holy Spirit, I need you. Come, sweet Spirit, I pray. Come in your strength and your power. Come in thine own gentle way. Come, Holy Spirit, I need thee. Come, sweet Spirit, I pray. Come in thy strength and thy power. Come in thine own gentle way. Amen. You have reasons to rejoice this morning? I do too. Plenty of them. One of them's walking up in front of me right now. <laughs> <laughs> I'm being handed something. Oh, yeah, we've had a... You know what? I'll have another prayer here in a second because we've had a couple of prayer requests come in on the Facebook. And uh, and let me make mention of, of one of them here, and then I'll read the others. But uh, we've been praying for a guy named Jack Miracle, and uh, that's the gentleman who's been fighting cancer and trying a lot of new treatments. It's our friend Debbie's dad. Uh, he passed away yesterday. Um... And so do pray for uh, do pray for his wife, pray for their family. But I'll tell you, I mean, the difference even yesterday in speaking to a couple of them is that they know exactly where he is. So even in the darkness, there is still reason to rejoice. And you know? Christ makes the difference. A request for uh, Bill Rogers' sister. She's in the hospital uh, in Huntington. Has some serious health issues. So we do need to remember her. Uh, Terry is still in the hospital after a surgery she had. Terry Rink. And is having some complications there, so we do pray for her. Uh, Sandy and Emma are traveling, and uh, so great travel mercies for them. And then Heather's mom and dad uh, both had doctor's appointments and stuff this week, so continued prayers for them. Uh, Heather's mom is doing a whole lot better than she was. Um, it was real kind of scary for a few days there. She's been home for uh, several days and uh, is doing much, much better, so continue to pray for her. And, uh, and Heather's dad, his name is Ricky, um, is having some health issues himself, so we pray for him as well. With that, we'll go to prayer with these, and, uh, and I'll lift the others just as, as unspoken, because it's pretty hard to do it out here. Um, and I'll, I'll, next week, I'll try to get an email around earlier so that we can compile a better list of these. I'm sorry about that. But uh, let's, let's go to prayer. Lord, we thank you this morning that uh, in the midst of what has just been a, a weird year, Lord, that there's still so much to celebrate. You are so good to us, and we have so many reasons to rejoice. Lord, we rejoice in the fact that we can bring you the stuff that we have needs for. Lord, you told us that you know our needs before we even ask, but you still told us to come to you anyway. And so, Lord, here we are with a few requests and a number of other unspoken. Lord, we pray that you be with the family of Jack, and, and Lord, we know that that uh, his wife Nancy and the, the kids and grandkids, that this is going to be a tough few days. Well, Lord, we do thank you that he lived a life in such a way that there is no doubt of his testimony. And Lord, we know that he is with you and, and doing much, much better than he's ever been right now. But Lord, we ask for your comfort for this family. Would you just surround them in your arms this morning? We think of Bill Rogers' sister in the hospital. Ask for your healing grace on her. Lord, as we read this morning, you are... God, who is our healer, you are Jehovah Rapha. Lord, we ask for a powerful healing touch 
on her right now in the hospital. Lord, we also pray for peace for Bill and for the whole family as well uh, as they're walking through that. We pray that you be with Terry, and Lord, we would ask for that same healing touch that you would put to right any of these complications post-surgery. Because, Lord, you know all the ins and outs of everything that's going on there. And, Lord, you are our great physician, and we trust you. And we lift Terry to you right now as well. Lord, we think of Sandy and Emma as they're traveling. Ask that you would surround them with your presence and with, uh, with your peace and grace, that you'd give them traveling mercies. Keep them safe and give them a good journey to and from. And Lord, just bless them this morning as well. And Lord, we do think of, uh, of Candy and Ricky, Heather's parents, who are dealing with some continued health issues. But Lord, we do thank you that, that especially Candy doing so much better right now. But Lord, we lift them both to you for your continued care. Lord, as they move forward with, with certain things, Lord, we ask for your presence and your peace to be among them and, Lord, among the whole family as well. Lord, we think of the many other requests that surely folks are lifting in their hearts this morning. And, Lord, though I can't hear them, we know that you do. You hear them all at one time, all around the world, and still know exactly what each individual person's needs are. Lord, we praise you for that. We thank you for that. Lord, we lift those to you anew this morning. Lord, whatever's on our hearts, and ask that you would move accordingly in healing and in peace and in grace and in help. And Lord, all those things that are needed today. Go with us the rest of this morning, we pray. We ask it in the name of Christ. Amen. Just a couple of quick uh, announcements and then I will let you go. Of course, when we when we leave here, uh, let's do the, the second row and then the third row and then this front row. Because it's the easiest to get people out and then have people back around. So uh, do be watching for that. Um, we are planning, we will be out here again next week. If you did not get the one call, um, that w we are outdoors through at least the end of the year, and then we'll reevaluate. We know a vaccine's coming. We know it'll be several months before everybody will be able to get it. And uh, so we're trying to just operate in the safest way we can. So I appreciate you all coming out to the drive-in service especially. Um, I know there are still some Terry Lynn nuts if you'd like to uh, pick up any of those. I mean, there are still some available for sale, so talk to Barb. I think you can also talk to Darlene. Is that right? Somebody know at me? Where are they? There, there. They're usually over here. <laughs> <Threw me off. laughs> I couldn't remember where you were parked. Um, but talk to one of them, and uh, they'll get you taken care of for that as well. And uh, I think that's all of the announcements right now. Somebody, if you have an announcement that I have missed, beep your horn or hit your flashes or something. Yes, no? Okay. okay. Well, we'll go ahead and dismiss. Uh, again, the second row, the third row, and then this front row, if you would. It's just the easiest to feed people around and through that way. And, uh, yeah, we pray the benediction. So now may the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord lift up the light of his divine countenance upon you and give you peace. In the name of God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. Amen. See you next week.